Hey, good morning, everybody. Glad you're here. Give a shout out, if you would. Give a shout out to our friends at Etiwana Gardens. Say hello, Etiwana Gardens. Great to have you with us. And also, Lone Hill, give a shout out to them. Hey, Lone Hill. One church, many locations, and you don't, you don't know how much by doing that little thing means to them. Think about it, because Lone Hill nor Etiwanda ever get me live. And so when they see you do that, they say, okay, we're part of this, okay? So even though it takes a little energy on your part, it's meaningful to them. They, it just kind of brings them in. So turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Philippians 2, 13. And uh, while you're doing that, one verse, one powerful verse in our series of Renovation of the Heart, and while you're doing that, Philippians 2, 13, uh, I'd like to ask you a couple questions, okay? Here's the first one. Do you believe that God is good? Wow. Okay, you're not sure. <laughs> Come on now. I want to hear you at Etiwanda, at Lone Hill, wherever you are. Do you believe that God is good? Yeah. Okay. And uh, don't say it if you don't think so. Okay. Second, do you think that God is good all the time? Yeah. All right. Now, you know, when I ask you questions like that, I'm setting you up. You know that. That's why some of you are thinking, I'm not sure if I want to say. <laughs> Sometimes you're in seasons of life. Well, that's a tough question to answer. I remember, and I'm, I'm doing this this weekend because I made a commitment to a, a family a lot of years ago. Um, and some of you remember Adriana. And I will talk about her about every probably eight months. And I do that because I made a commitment to her mother and her father that I would never let our church forget her. And so if you don't know her, you're about to find out who she is. Uh, she, was a, she was nine years old when I first met her. The elders had been praying for her in the cafe, and she was in a wheelchair. She contracted a disease that is very rare uh, among older people and even more rare against younger people. It's where there's an internal hardening of the organs. And basically, you, you start to disintegrate and you die very young. So I met her when she was nine years old. Her parents were distraught. They were just a wreck. This was, you know, uh, this was the young girl, a father, a mother, loved her so much, so active, so full of joy. Even when I met her in the wheelchair, she was still laughing and joking. She was, there was never a time I can remember with Adriana that she wasn't happy, even though she was going through a miserable life at so young. They tried all kinds of remedies and cures. Nothing seemed to work, so they finally decided a bone marrow transplant, and she was about 10 or 11 at this time. No, actually more like 12. So she went with her mother to Seattle. Stayed, her father stayed behind. Of course, what this, this caused a lot of... Uh, this hap often happens when a child suffers so much that the parents become estranged from one another because they're so engulfed with trying to cure the child that they grow apart from one another. And the bone marrow transplant was so painful that by the end of that journey, and we're talking from the age of 9 to 13 now, that Adriana finally said to her mom something you'd never want to hear as a parent from your child. She said, let me, let me just die and go home and be with God. It's too painful. And so we sat with Adriana over at her home in San Dimas the night that she did die. And I remember that we were singing and trying to comfort and encourage, and the end was so painful and, and I think a lot of us struggled with okay God I got that you're not gonna heal her we prayed that and you've obviously decided not to but does the, the does the end have to be so long you know and the, the prayer that we were praying by that time was God just take her take her now no more pain no more suffering and so can I ask the question again do you believe that God is good yes. and, and do you believe that God is good all the time do you believe then that God would ever allow you to suffer? Yes. Do you believe that God is ever surprised at your suffering? <laughs> so you never think there's a time when God says, whoops, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> do you believe that God is all-powerful? Yes. He can do whatever he wants. Yes. Do you believe that God loves you? Yes. And you say, what does this have to do with this theme of renovation? Absolutely everything. Everything. Now, this sermon has two parts to it, and I want you to bear with me on this, okay? The first part is very abstract, and if you're in a time in your life when you're suffering, this isn't going to help you. 
This is a message, this is part of what I do to equip you to be able to answer questions from people who are asking questions, because this issue is a, is a primary issue with people who find it hard to have faith and trust in God when they see the pain and suffering in the lives of people, especially in the lives of children. That's why I used Adriana as an example. So the first part, I need you to take a deep breath and let me do this work, and I need you to concentrate because it's important. Then I want to move away from the abstract into how do we help those who are born again to deal with these seasons of their lives, like Adriana and like Adriana's mom and father and her family. How do you deal with that? How do you, how do you possibly go on? See, when I ask you if God is good, if, you're, if things are okay in your life right now, you're going to say yes with vigor. But I guarantee you, if things are hell right now in your life, you're going to have a hard time shouting that. You may believe it, but you're not in the mood to say it right now. And so... Go with me through the first part, and then let's move together to the second part. Here's the first part. When a tragedy happens, like with Adriana, there are four victims, four. The first victim is the child who loses her life. <clears throat> but is it not true that God can recover from this loss? And the reason that God can recover from this loss, now I told you this is the abstract part. I'm not looking to this to comfort you. I'm looking at you to think about this from a logic perspective. Since to God, our entire existence on earth is represented by this line, eternity is represented by this line. And notice it doesn't stop. Since God is the author and sustainer of all life, then when a, a young girl dies, although she may die, she still lives. Because the God who gave life the first time is able to give life the second time. So even though she stops existing on earth, she doesn't stop existing. So that God sees every life through the lens of eternity, which enables him to do what he'll do here because he knows this is the reality. So to the skeptic, I would say, well, yes, there's pain here. But God can recover because the God who gave life the first time gives it the second time, and the second life is far greater than the first life, right? Now, again, if you're not in the midst of this, it's not going to help you that much, but this may prepare you for something in the future. That's why it's brilliant in the mind of God concerning the resurrection of Jesus. God could have done anything to show that Jesus was God in the flesh. He chose the resurrection. Why? Because the biggest issue we all have is why, if God is God, do we suffer so much here? And the answer is we don't know. But what we do know is it's what? The weight of glory. The weight of glory. What we endure here is nowhere near worth comparing with what we will experience here. And for Paul to say in Philippians 1.21, for me to live as Christ and to die is gain, then you have to ask, how can dying be gain unless it is a life more beautiful and ultimate than the life here? This is not equality. It's not like, well, I'll trade this for that. It's not equality. The second life, the latter life is far more glorious, far more, far more valuable than the life we live here. The weight of glory, C.S. Lewis said, the weight of glory, the weight of glory. So that there may be a finality to existence here, but not to existence itself. And what is to come, according to Scripture, is far, listen, it's not, it's not merely far greater, but it's actually the way things God intended them to be from the beginning. So the life that is lost is not lost when it is in the hands of the one who made it and sustains it. It may cease to exist here, but it doesn't cease to exist. We are eternal. We are more than our bodies, and you know that. The real you is on the inside, the soul, and it lives forever. How do you destroy non-material? You don't. The soul is meant to exist. Second victim is now the one who has to stay behind, the one who grieves and survives the loss of the person they loved. Okay, so fine. The person we've lost, they're gone. They're with God, but what about us now? We stay behind, and we have memories, and we have pain and suffering because of the person that we've lost. How do we deal with that? Someone has said the view from the hearse is a painful one. The one who's died, they may be in a good space, but what about those of us left behind? 
For most of us, when that happens, questions come like, why? God, I don't get it. This person was a good person. We start, we start playing the morality card. I do it, you do it, we do it. This was a good person. Don't we need more good people left behind? Why do you keep taking the good people? Why don't you remove the evil people? And if you need some names and addresses, I've got them for you. <laughs> so it's the why. Why them? Why them? Why not, why not th- those people? And then there's the void that we fill. And I go back to something, and if you ever wonder, why does Pastor Jeff say the same thing over and over? It's because there are some things worth repeating, because I figure if I repeat it enough, sooner or later you'll be able to say it. And when Job went to God and asked him, why? Why? Remember, God, if you can just explain to me why, because Job 1.1 tells us he was a blameless and righteous man. And yet he lost all of his kids, all of his livestock, he lost everything, man, everything. And he ends up laying on a a bed of, of ash where just something soft that would remove the pain from the physical sores. And he says to God, God, if you'll just explain to me why this is happening, then I'll be able to endure it. And Job, what, what happens? God comes to him and says, Job, Job, Job. Job, where were you when I made the foundations of the earth? And remember what we said. God asked him those series of questions to get Job to open up within his own assumptions. Job, you think that you'll be able to endure it if you fully and and exhaustively understand it? And then God says, Job, have you ever been to the very expanse of the constellations? Do you know how deep and wide space really is? Do you know what's all, do you know what's out there? Do you understand how the sun sets and rises? Job, have you been to the depths of the ocean? Do you know how deep the ocean really, do you know what's down there? Have you ever been there? And then he goes to something simple. Do you understand how a deer gives birth to the young? in the wilderness that's and basically what God is saying is Job Job there's a thousand things that you readily accept every day for which you do not have exhaustive understanding your pain is no different I often wondered why God didn't give Job the reason because you and I know it because we're we know the upper level story but Job can only see the lower level story but I'm afraid that if God would given Job an answer for why he's suffering the way that he's suffering then you and I might read it and think that's the answer for us. But the truth is, the answer is different for every person, depending on what season of life, depending on what God's trying to do, depending on his ultimate objective. The other thing is, what about those who are left behind? What about those of us who suffer? But Job also helps us to answer that because he writes in Job 42, near the end of the book, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. What's he saying? He's saying that, you know, there's a glimpse of God that you get in pain that you would never get in pleasure. You're going to see God in a way that you've never seen him before, and you're not going to do that in pleasure when everything's going well. Habakkuk does the same thing. It's not just Job. Habakkuk says this, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. These are real people penning real words who are suffering real tragedies. These are not abstract events. And in both cases, the authors basically say this. I don't know why I'm going through this, but I know this. My Redeemer lives, and in the end, he will stand upon the earth. And I know even now, he says, he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He makes me light on my feet. He enables me to go to places I never thought I could go. So that the message of the Bible is that although you may never have an exhaustive understanding of what's happening in your life, God does promise you a prevailing presence to walk you through every step of the way. And the thing to do when you're going through difficulties is not run from God, because if you run from God, to what are you going to go? Run to God And the Bible says that God reveals himself in special ways. You will see things that you usually don't see. You will feel things that you don't usually feel. You will be able to do things you didn't think you could do. For the born-again person, what God accomplishes in you during the tragedy is just as important as the tragedy itself. So yeah, you're going to have doubt, fear, and anxiety, and stress. It's still going to come, but it's all going to come in the context of trust. And for the born-again believer, you are going to have doubts, and God is big enough to handle them. But there's an overarching trust in your life to know that God is sovereign. And somehow through the midst of this, you know down deep inside that he's got this. And that's why sorrow may be peripheral, but joy remains central to your life. In the most famous verse probably ever written in literary antiquity, David, in the midst of his suffering, says this, and you know it well, even though I walk through the darkest valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They give me guidance. They give me wisdom. They give me direction. You prepare a table before me. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You sustain me with spiritual food, he says, even when I'm physically falling apart. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I will draw strength from your presence, even when I think I can't go on. So the first victim, the one who lost, It's not really lost, but found in the presence of God. The second victim, the one who remains, God doesn't leave them abandoned or orphaned, but he reveals himself. He becomes revealer and comforter to the one he requires to go through the difficult time. Now, I know we're still in the abstract. Third, the third victim is the skeptic who stands by and condemns the act and the resulting loss as wicked or evil. This is one of the questions we face as apologists all the time. People will say, you know, I just can't find it in my heart to believe in your God because, man, if I were God, I sure wouldn't run the universe like this. And they would say, because there's so much evil and wickedness in the world, I don't believe there's a God. Now, you've heard me deal with this before. There's a problem there because if God is not real, then you really shouldn't be upset. Because if, if God is not real, then life is not sacred then we're nothing but a bunch of chemicals here by accident. So when someone dies or someone suffers, you should just understand, in the words of Tennyson, that evolution is red in tooth and claw. And it's all just dumb, blind luck. In fact, it's the survival of the fittest. So if someone suffers and dies, it's because they're not fit. So they're not surviving. It's the gene pool strengthening and shedding the weak. So if that's true, there is no God, then there should be no pain. You should be, there should be no sadness because of pain and suffering. In some regards, there should be a little bit of elation. You say, well, how's that? Well, if we indeed are the random product of evolution, then aggression and domination are good things, right? If this is an evolutionary world, micro, macro, atheistic evolution, then the reality is that we are just shedding the bad things of life so that the ones who are good can be even more strengthened and humanity can prosper but you know in your heart that's baloney because you know that life is sacred and that there is love and that there is value but that can only exist in a created scenario where god exists so the point is that you have to resolve the issue of pain and suffering in the context of god you can't resolve it outside of god because outside of god you can't even defend the very question. But inside, we do have to resolve it. We have to come up with some answers. And I'm not saying that we'll have all the answers. I mean, if we had all the answers, who would we be? Donald Trump. (laughs) That is not a political statement. It's just a little joke. It's just a little joke. It's just a little joke. That's all it is. We'd be who? We'd be God. We'd be God. And we're not God. And I remember Jeff Vines, this pastor, one time saying this pretty bad when you're quoting yourself, isn't it? (laughs) The things I do not understand do not change the things I do. And I've always said that. In the deepest, darkest moments of my life, when my mom died, when we lost our first child, when those things happened, I am confused. I do struggle. But just because there are things I don't know or understand doesn't change the things I do know. There is a God. And that God loves me because he gave his own son for me. And that never changes. There is a greater evil, though, than pain and suffering in the world. There is a greater evil than death. And do you know what it is? God can recover from your death. He can make life again. And it's going to be far greater than the previous life. But you can't recover from spiritual death. If you choose to live your life apart from God, separating yourself from Him, and living contrary to His purposes, spiritual death you can't recover from. Spiritual alienation. And in the words of C.S. Lewis, God looks you in the eye and says, okay, not my will, but yours be done. If you choose to live away from God, there's no recovery. Every answer to the problem of pain, every answer that I've ever heard, not only fails to satisfy, it fails to even justify the question. And then the fourth victim is the questioner who asks this, how is it that God could be sovereign over death, but we do not individually have the same right to take a life? This is what I've heard more recent. In other words, here's what it's saying. How come God gets to choose who lives and dies, but I don't? Well, my first response is, well, that's what you're doing through abortion. You're you're making yourself God. You decide who lives or dies for convenience or for other purposes. But there is a difference between you and God, and I hope you know what it is. The reason God can determine who lives or dies is because he has the character 
to make the right choice and the power to restore life after it's been taken away. You don't have that power. So God can do with us here what he wants knowing that it's a temporary condition and the weight of glory, the weight of glory. What we suffer here can no, in no way be compared with what is going to be revealed in us. Ravi Zacharias, my friend, says this, God alone can allow tragic events because he alone can restore life through tragedies and reveal the destructiveness of sin through tragedies. Being perfect in his decisions, pure in his reason, and able to give strength to those who seek his comfort. We cannot claim such absoluteness. Our characters are not pure. But you know, more than this, the thing that's really helped me in this and the thing that the Bible teaches through stories like Jairus' daughter, which I'm not going to go into. I've already covered that. But if you just imagine the world full of dots, and every dot, billions of them, represents a life, every life impacts another to some degree in close proximity. Everything that happens to me impacts you. Everything that happens to you impacts people around you. And so God, in his infinite wisdom, is the only one that is able to, to know what has to happen in every dot for all dots to be pulled upward toward him. It doesn't mean that every dot will be. Some people will still use their freedom to reject God. But God knows that every event that happens in every life impacts not only you, but impacts people around you. And the reality is that sometimes what happens to you is not for you. It's for somebody else. Now, I've seen in my own life, sometimes the illness of a father will bring the children to God. Sometimes the death of a mother will turn the hearts of the children toward each other. Sometimes the loss of a job will catalyze faith and trust in God's provision. And only God is wise enough to bounce all these little dots all together to accomplish his ultimate purpose. This is what I've been trying to say for a long, long time, going back to Sam Gamgee in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, where he asked that question when he really discovers that Gandalf, his friend that he thought was dead, is actually alive. He asked the question, does that mean that one day is everything going to become untrue? And the answer, of course, for the Christian is yes. All those times that appeared to be senseless in your life, all those times where no good seemed to come out of anything, all those times that seemed to be a waste, was well, because you're not God. But one day you'll see how God put all the little dots together and how every event in every life worked together to fulfill his ultimate purpose. Every event. You'll see how they're connected, how God's good and perfect plan... In other words, from a total philosophical point of view, the pain that you're experiencing is not a waste. It is for the glory and the work of God. You say, I have a hard time with that. Well, I go back to the cross one last time. Did it appear that evil was winning? Did it appear that God had lost control? Did it appear that the disciples would never recover? Did it appear that a senseless, meaningless crime had been committed? Did it appear that a sinless, righteous man had been murdered for no good cause? That's why the cross is brilliant in the mind of God, and it is the ultimate, ultimate answer to all pain and suffering, because when all seems lost, all is one. Now, where does that leave us? Okay, now, that, that was the abstract part. Where does that leave us? And what does this have to do with renovation? Everything. Everything. This is it. Jesus replied to John back in our passage with Nicodemus, very truly, this is John 3, 3, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. What I have begun to understand over the course of years of study, and I'm sure that some of you have been Christians a long time, longer than me, longer than I, you know this too, that the real test of authentic faith, of being born again, is that you're able to see things that people can't see in the midst of trials and suffering. And that's why if you're not born again, there's no way you're ever going to take it. Because you don't see the kingdom. But when you see the kingdom, you're like Corey Tin Boom, who's in the hellish situation of a concentration camp, who says no matter how deep the pit of despair, his love is deeper still. How do you do that? You're born again. You see things. You see a reality that others don't see. It's almost like in the Bible, the real test of being born again, the real test of a renovated heart is when your heart begins to trust God. I didn't say you don't doubt. I didn't say you don't suffer. I didn't say you don't have pain and crying and weeping. But ultimately, down deep inside somewhere where it really matters, you know that God 
has shifted the wind. What? I tell you that no one can see the kingdom unless he's born again. And then, I'm not going to put it on the screen yet, but he says to Nicodemus, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it's come from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now, it took us a long time to get there. Stay with me. Go back to Philippians 2.13 now. It took us a long time to get there. Here's what it says. The first part of the verse says this, that we are to work out our own salvation. Cartagersomai, which is a word basically that means this. Bring to completion your salvation. Why were you saved? According to the Bible, were you saved to get you to heaven? Yes and no. The ultimate purpose of you being saved is to make you like Jesus. And the Bible says that your job, there are two entities, your job is to respond to the work of God. But here's what God's job is, and this is where all of this comes together, verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The Greek word there, works, is energes. It's the word for divine energy. It's the Holy Spirit's work in you. But thelo is a very interesting word. It says to will. And the idea is that God makes a choice. And then he acts accordingly. I know of another explanation for this verse than this. That it is God who decides what he's going to allow into your life and what he's going to prevent from entering your life. Not you. And whatever God decides to allow or to prevent, your job is to receive it, embrace it, and allow God to do his work. Now, folks, I want to tell you, this is an unpopular message today. To help me understand this, and we're already near the end, so stay with me here. This is a Thomas Kincaid painting that I was given about 15 years ago. It's one of my favorite paintings. Because according to Scripture, the ocean is the world the boat is your life and the wind is the Spirit of God coming from all different directions and here's how this works if you got a motorboat in a motorboat you're in control you start the engine you control the speed that's why I love James Bond movies they always have a motorboat race and every single one of them and I love the one in Roger Moore's A Live or Let Die through the swamps of New Orleans. In a speedboat, you're in control. This is not a speedboat. You're in total control. You start the engine. You control the speed. You just about control everything. But not in a sailboat. In a sailboat, it's a different story. You're not passive. You have a definite role to play. You do have to hoist the sail. But it is God who sends the wind. And without the wind... You're dead in the water. There's no forward movement. You are utterly dependent upon the wind. Jesus says that when the wind blows, the wind of the Spirit blows, you don't know where it's going to come from, you don't know where it's headed, which means you don't know where it's going to blow you. But your job is always the same. Wherever the winds of the Spirit blow into your life, your job is to hoist the sail and allow God to take you into waters, even when they are troubled. Jeff, are you telling me that part of renovation of my heart may hurt a little? No. It may hurt a lot. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Do you know the Greek word for pain? Perosmos and thlipsis. Both of them, the etymology of those words, the history of those words is a vineyard owner removing his shoes and stomping on the grapes until the good stuff comes out. <laughs> Which means that God reserves the right at seasons in your life to take off his shoes and step on you and squeeze you until the good stuff comes out. Because the ultimate goal for your life is to make you like Jesus. And sometimes what happens to you has nothing to do with you, but people around you. But we know it's okay for God because we're told we're not our own. We've been bought with a price. And we know that he'll give us a prevailing presence. 
See, part of us wants to say to God, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are to decide what gets into my life and what does, who, and what would he say? Well, I'm the giver and sustainer of all life. That's all. In times when the winds of the Spirit blows your life into troubled waters, God says, hoist the sails, because I'm doing a work. You don't see it. You may never see it. You trust it. You will hurt, you will cry, you will question, you will beg, and you will plead, but you will also trust. Because it's Christ in you. And you will continually look at the cross to know that when all seems lost, all is one. It is the only answer I can give you. And so you live by faith that God is going to complete his work. That's why Paul told the Philippians, even when he was in prison, I thank God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of redemption or the day of Jesus Christ. I used to pray that God would do whatever he needs to do so that my children may see him. God, do whatever you have to do in my children's life so that they can see you. As I got older, I thought, you know, I don't think that's a very clever prayer. I think I need to reword that. Because when Saul of Tarsus saw God, he had to be blinded, lose his eyesight, be totally dependent on other people to restore him. And then he lived a life of just torture and punishment. He was shipwrecked, exiled. He was beaten in prison. I mean... 40 lashes he received nine times. I mean, here's a guy that suffered immensely, and yet he knew God more than anyone else. There is a part of you that as difficult as it's going to be, when the winds of the Spirit blow you into troubled waters, you are called upon by God to submit. I know you don't want to hear that. 1 Corinthians 6, you are not your own, you were bought with a price. The person who is not born again will never be able to do this because they don't see the kingdom. And you will live with hatred, bitterness, and frustration. And sorrow will be central, joy only peripheral. And please don't tell me, please don't say, Jeff, you don't understand. Because I've lost both my parents at a young age. I've lost a child of my own. I have suffered from mental illness that for some reason God granted me a victory over after three years. So don't tell me that I'm clueless about tragedy. But I do know this, trust Faith and submission reveals that you are indeed born again. When you're able to do that, I didn't say you're perfect, but when you're able just to stand strong, I know you're going to doubt, you're going to worry, you're going to cry, you're going to weep. All of those things are reality, man. And there's a time for those things, but ultimately down deep inside, you know in your heart, you're good with God. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells you that your response to that is the test of who you really are. 1 Peter 1, in all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to have suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, I find that to be a hard passage. Not, not the, just the reality that the real you will be revealed when the rug is pulled out from under you, what you really believe in. What I find difficult about this I think I've used the illustration before when my, my mother, on a few occasions I can remember her waking me up at like 3 o'clock in the morning and just weeping and hugging me because she had had a dream that, that I had been killed or something bad had happened. So what do moms do? It's so real to them, they just run in the bedrooms of their kids and just hug them. And of course, when you're a kid, you're thinking, Mom, get, get, a, get a grip, man, what's going on? I'm trying to sleep here. Until you have kids of your own and you have a dream that something happened to them and what do you find yourself doing? Going in the room, opening the door, are they okay, are they okay? When you've lost something, the return of what you have lost means that much more to you. Mom didn't come and hug me every day. It wasn't typical for mom to hug me just when she thought she had lost me. When you lose something and what you lost is restored, it makes it that more meaningful. Do you know that this passage is saying that the things we lose here 
will make our worship of God that more intense when he replaces what we have lost to an infinitely greater degree. So when I see my mom in heaven, the, the intense worship of God, think about, think about somebody you've lost and the reality hits you that, okay, I've lost them, but it's a temporary loss. I will see them again. Whatever seas you find yourself in, here's what you do not know. You do not know if God sent it or allowed it or even if you brought it on yourself. Ooh, that's a painful one. But Hebrews 10, 12, 10 says, they disciplined us for a little while as though they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. Sometimes God disciplines us that we may become conformed to the image of Christ, that we might be sanctified. Sometimes you have seas of correction. Other times you have seas of perfection. And it's very difficult to know which one's happening. But the calling on your life is the same. Hoist the sails, embrace the rough seas, and let God do his work in you. You say, but how do I do that, Jeff? I've got to tell you, I just don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. Well, Jesus said in Matthew 6, Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That is worth gold. Because the only way you're going to be able to survive, whatever it is that you're surviving, is 24 hours at a time. When you try to guess what's going to happen tomorrow, or 10 years from now, or 20, you're going to live with bitterness, hatred. But when you say, you know what? Tomorrow I will live with trust in God. And then I'm going to get up the next day, I'm going to live with trust in God again. And I'm going to see why God, over time, has blown the ship of my life into difficult seas. I guess what I'm trying to say is in the roughest, toughest waters of our lives, that's where we meet God. And if you really want God to change you from the inside out, you've got to be willing for him to put you in situations where you're at the very end of yourself, the very end, I mean the very end in, to where you call on God in tears. And the Bible says that God comes to you as redeemer, as revealer, as comforter. And you'll be able to see God the way you've never seen him, feel things you've never felt before, and do things you never thought you could do. And in the midst of all of that, God changes you from the inside out, and you'll never be the same. Did you know that Mother Teresa, this is the end of the message, so stay with me here. Mother Teresa, living and working in Calcutta, and there's been... There's been so much information released about Mother Teresa, and every time I mention Mother Teresa, I always get a few emails. Why are you talking about Mother Teresa? She was Catholic. <laughs> yes, you're hearing waves. Mother Teresa was very um, open with some people about her struggle with God because of all the pain and the suffering that she saw on the streets of Calcutta. We're talking about poverty like you can't imagine. People living in cardboard boxes, that's the totality of their life until they die. She held many babies that would not be alive the next day. And she struggled to feel God at times in her life. But do you know, the rest of the Mother Teresa story is coming out pretty soon. Do you know the last four words Mother Teresa uttered before she died? I love you, Jesus. In the midst of the most difficult seasons of her life, she found him. And she loved him. What's not to love about the one who restores all that has been lost? And who asks you, that during this season, you allow him to do what he's going to do, to act and to will and to do in you for his good purposes. Even when his good purposes may be not for you, someone else. As all of our lives bounce against each other. See, I believe at this point that Adriana changed. So I saw the amount of lives that were changed because of the way in her death she taught us all how to live and she will be forever remembered. God does his best renovative work in your life when he sees a storm coming and instead of guiding your boat to calm seas, the wind shifts and he blows you right in the midst of it. That 
is the truth of the Bible that I don't necessarily like that much, but that I can't change. Listen, we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. And there will come a time in your life when that will be peace to you, to know. No need to worry, because God will be God and will have his way with you. But that's okay, because whatever he requires of you now, it's not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in you. And Father, I thank you and praise you for your goodness. And I, I know that this is a hard message for all of us to take. I pray for comfort and strength in those who need it so desperately. I pray that in no way I would have belittled any one situation, but my heart would come out that we love them we love each other and we don't know what to do at all times and all seasons we have enough trouble of our own but I pray that through waters uncharted my soul will embark I will follow your voice straight into the dark and if from the course you intend I depart speak to the sails of my wondering heart like the wind you'll guide clear the skies before me and I'll glide this open sea like the stars your word will align my voyage and remind me where I've been and where I'm going. Jesus, my captain, my soul's trusted Lord, all my allegiance is rightfully yours. Jesus, my captain, my soul's trusted Lord, all my allegiance is rightfully yours. And so it is that we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.